Meh, we ain't doing this again. Part 2 of the diesel swap's been delayed due to shipping delays. It seems like that's the new normal these days. Anyway, today's episode was directed by our cameraman, Duke, and it's a little bit different. Let us know if he should keep his day job, or I should fire him. Alright, roll the tape! So let's play a game and see if we can find the problem with this car. A few weeks ago, we picked this Saturn Crew Cab up for a reasonable price, but it had some problems. Let's take a look. Did you spot it? Yeah, it's missing a hubcap, and that kind of brings the car down. The good news is, people sell hubcaps on the internet. Now, $35 for a hubcap is outrageous, but I'm lazy, and this is the easy way to fix the car. Yeah, that's much better. Now, something else looks a bit off. Yeah, there it is. The fender's a different color. Hmm. Let's take a closer look and see what we can do about this. All right, it's definitely the wrong color, but I'm also seeing something else. You see, most of the body panels on a Saturn are made from plastic, and that's good because... It ain't gonna rust, but sometimes the panels will crack if hit hard enough. And right here we have a pretty big crack of some sort. Now I did some research and found that regular polyester body filler is not gonna work on this fender. Actually the stuff they recommended for this type of repair is very expensive, and it's far cheaper just to replace the fender. Oh, look at that, just in time. Well, darn it, it's still the wrong color, but I reckon we can fix that. So this fender is in near perfect condition, and I only paid $10 for it. The paint and the clear coat are intact, and all we really need to do is sand down this minor chip, and then prep the fender for paint. Now we're going to do our best to make this fender look good, but we will literally be happy with anything. So we're going to start off with 400 grit wet and dry, just to knock down the surface, and we'll pay extra attention to making this chip in the paint flatten out. I'm kind of old school when it comes to stuff like this, and I like to crank up the stereo while I'm working. Unfortunately, I would get a YouTube copyright strike if I treated you folks to my personal tunes. And before long, we had the fender prep for paint. It's important to get all the nooks and crannies and knock down any glossy surfaces. You see, the paint will likely fail in these spots once the car is exposed to real-world driving. Now, I've painted several cars in the past with professional equipment, but today we're going to take a shortcut and go with custom mix paint from Automotive Touch-Up. Now keep in mind, this channel doesn't have sponsors, and that's because we like to give our honest opinion on the stuff that we use. Anyway, I've used paint from this vendor before, and I'll be honest, it never matches. So, we got that going for us. So first up, we're going to use a decent quality SEM brand primer in white. In case you didn't know, it's beneficial to choose a primer in approximately the same color as the top coat, if possible. White was the closest I could find in a brand name vendor, so that's what we went with. Over here we have a can of base coat, and that was custom mixed for a gold 1995 Saturn. And over here we have a can of clear coat. Including the primer, we're looking at about $65 here. So, not too expensive but you get what you pay for. Fast forward a bit and the fender's in primer and we let it bake in the sun for a day or so. Then we knock down the surface with 400 grit wet and dry and I reckon it's ready for its first coat of paint. The painting went well. We took the time to get the corners first and then applied the rest of the paint. It appears we had just enough to paint this fender. Next comes the clear coat and once again we took our time and applied the clear to the fender and several coats. Fast forward a bit and the paint is fully cured in the sunlight. Not too bad. Around these parts, legend has it if the iron horse runs west chasing the sun, well, you're in for some bad luck. Thankfully, the paint's already dry and at this point, what could possibly go wrong? Well, I'm pretty excited to get the wagon back together. The paint, well... It looks a bit lighter, but I'm okay with that. Let's put the fender on the car and see how it looks. Okay, well maybe the curse of the iron horse is real. The paint, eh, it looks good, but it ain't the right color. And the fender, well, it ain't the right fender for this car. <laughs> Let's take a closer look. So it turns out this fender's from a 1995 Saturn Coupe, and the cut of the jib is a little bit different. Well, it's a lot different. And no matter how long I look at this, it ain't gonna fit. Nope. We got three men down and still haven't accomplished our objective. Time to fall back and regroup. Jimbo, 
So suddenly I found myself in a field surrounded by Saturns. Was this heaven or was I still dreaming? Let's find out. Perhaps this is my hell. A perfectly good Saturn hood, but somebody stepped on it. Let's see if the fender's any good. Well, I think this is going to do it. Obviously, it's going to need paint, but it looks like it's in perfect condition. It wasn't easy, but we managed to remove the fender from this old heap. A few of the bolts were nearly impossible to get to. Eh, it sucks working in the tall grass with the bugs crawling around and whatnot. Let's end this nightmare and go back to the shop where there's less bugs and less nature. <laughs> Meh, we ain't doing this again. So this time around I cruised over to O'Reilly's Auto Parts for the paint. The cool thing is, O'Reilly's can mix the paint and put it in an aerosol can. This batch of paint took about 10 minutes for the technician to throw together, and that was cool. The only problem with this stuff is, it's single stage paint, and what that means is, it doesn't require a clear coat. Eh, some people may like that, and some may not. Personally, I feel the clear coat is necessary in order to match the depth of the paint. And even though this paint doesn't require a clear coat, we're going to shoot some on anyway. For the primer, we went with the white SEM high build that we used before, and basically, we prepped the fender exactly like the previous fender. Let's see how it came out. Yeah, it's definitely looking a lot better. The O'Reilly's paint seems to match the original color of the car really well, so we're going to call this one a success. The mismatched fender certainly wasn't the only problem. We took a risk when buying this car because it was undrivable due to a transmission problem. Fortunately, we were able to repair the transmission by installing a new set of shifter cables. The cables were cheap, but it took a few hours off camera to install them. Now at the back of the car, there was an issue with the rear suspension. This is actually a common problem with Saturns, and most of the time it's just a broken radius rod. But sometimes an issue like this can be the result of severe underbody rust. New radius rods are still available, however, in the interest of saving money, we pulled the rod from our parts car. You know, at this point, the car has only been driven around the parking lot. Hmm. I think it's about time we take the car out for its first road test. Oh yeah, since I'm still suffering from temporary hearing loss, I'm going to use this recorder in order to listen to all the noises, because quite frankly, I can't hear a thing. And I reckon this car will sound as quiet as a Rolls Royce, at least to me. Well, right away it's obvious that the steering wheel's off-center and the car's probably going to need an alignment. As far as the engine goes, it seems to run really well. Now this car has the twin cam engine and it also has the close ratio transmission, so it's hard to compare this car to the base model Saturn Coupe that we've been experimenting with. The Coupe has a single cam engine with a wide ratio transmission. Although the engine blocks are the same on both cars, the cylinder heads are different. The engine in the Coupe makes its power on the low end, and the engine in this car is a bit more zippy and builds its power on the top end. The transmissions are geared differently in order to match the engine's power band. So far the car seems to handle fine, but I've noticed a bit of vibration every time I press the brakes. Let's do a hard stop and see how the brakes feel about that. Whoa, there's a whole lot of shaking going on. Well, the brakes work fine and the car does stop, but we have something weird going on with the rotors. That's something we need to look at. So far the clutch feels fine. Let's stress test it and see if it'll hold under a load. Okay, so now I'll put the car in fifth gear and floor the accelerator. If the clutch is weak, it'll start slipping at wide open throttle. Most of the time it'll be obvious and the engine RPMs will skyrocket and we should be able to see that on the tachometer. Eh, the clutch seems okay, so that's good. Oh look, the sparrows are flying again. Anybody get that obscure reference? Anyway, replacing the clutch on one of these cars can be a bit tricky, but the good news is, if driven properly, these clutches will outlast the car. 
Today sure is a busy day for the birds. Must be a Thursday. Anyway, we seem to have upset this vulture's yummy roadside meal. Eh, I think I'd rather eat at McDonald's. Let's try them brakes again. Oh yeah, something's foobar down there. So now we have a check engine light. Ah, this poor car is not having a good day. The engine seems to make plenty of power and the acceleration is really good. Let's head back to the shop and try to sort out some of these problems. On the road test, we noticed heavy vibrations being telegraphed through the steering column on hard braking. Now, this could be a serious problem, or if we're lucky, it's something simple. But the only way to find out is to take a look at the brakes and the front end components and see if we can figure out what's going on. Well, the good news is the ball joints and the tie rods are in excellent condition. Better yet, the brakes on this car appear to be brand new. But new is subjective. I reckon these brakes were replaced 10 or 15 years ago and possibly even longer than that. They appear to only have a few hundred miles on them. Even though the calipers appear new, they're more or less seized, and the rotors have shadows in them from the brake pads. The brake pads themselves actually look brand new. I reckon we could get away with just turning the rotors and possibly rebuilding the calipers. But at this point, it almost makes sense to replace the calipers and rotors as far as cost goes. And that's what we did. We also threw in new pads just for fun. The rotors look weird because they're Raybestos Element 3s with some sort of corrosion coating on them. Now I'm sure the coating will almost immediately wear off the friction surface, but I'm curious how the rest of the rotors will hold up. It'll be interesting. It's unfortunate that we had to replace most of the brakes even though they appeared to be basically brand new, but this car has a mysterious past and it seems like for the past 20 years or so, it really hasn't been driven much. And I base that on the fact that the tires are old and dry rotted, but still have plenty of tread on them. This sounds crazy, but I think the date code is indicating the tires were installed in 1998. After replacing the brakes, we road tested the car again, and the vibrations were indeed gone, and the car stopped normally. Fast forward a few hundred miles, and let's take another look at those rotors. So far, the rotors are holding up great, and there's no issues to report. I was more or less curious to what happened to the coating that was applied to the friction surface. And as you can see, it's long gone. Now, I'm pretty sure this is completely normal. Allegedly, this coating will protect the non-friction surfaces from future rust, and that may be true. But as we can see over here, the coating has already been damaged by bolting the wheel up to the hub. So yeah, I'm not too optimistic this stuff's going to hold up better than spray paint, but you never know. We'll check it again in a few minutes and see how it's doing. Although it's hard to see, we did get a check engine light during our road test. I reckon we need to check that out. Now this car being a 1995, it's unfortunately not equipped with the OBD2 diagnostic system. Nope, this car has the OBD1 system, which is pretty much crap because we won't be able to use any of the commonly available and cheap diagnostic aids. So this is the ALDL connector on the Saturn, and it looks similar to the OBD2 connectors on most modern cars, but of course none of the OBD2 devices will work on this car. And to check the codes, we'll need a paper clip. So, <clears throat> this might sound weird, but I don't have a paper clip. Instead, we're going to use a short piece of jumper wire. Once the wire is in place, we can turn the ignition on and retrieve the codes via the check engine light. At this point, with the ALDL pins jumped, the car is in diagnostic mode. Let's count the blinks of the check engine light. So that's a single flash, a pause, and then two flashes. That translates to a code 12, and a code 12 indicates the car is in diagnostic mode. The code 12 should flash three times, then we'll get to the actual trouble codes that we're seeking. Alright, here comes the real trouble codes. And three flashes, a pause, then two flashes. So that's a code 32. Now a code 32 is sort of a vague message, and it means there's something wrong with the EGR system. It literally could be anything, so we'll have some work to do. Fortunately on this engine, the EGR valve is right on top, and it's easy to service. Now there's going to be several places to start when troubleshooting the EGR valve. We're going to do the simple stuff. Well, the first thing is, the valve appears to be connected to the harness, and that's good. And the pins appear to be in good condition. So at this point, we need to pull the valve off and check for carbon buildup. 
Oh wow, these motor mounts are really loose. We'll deal with that another day. Today it's the EGR. Getting the valve off the engine is going to ruin the gasket no matter what we do. But most of the time, even though we damage the gasket, it'll be fine. So initially I don't see any evidence of significant carbon buildup, but let's do a little scraping. Nah, I'm not really feeling any obstructions. Next we're going to start the engine and it'll blow out any loose chunks of carbon. Okay, well that's a good sign. The loud exhaust means the path from the exhaust system is clear, and the high idle speed means the path to the intake manifold is open. If the idle were normal, or the exhaust was quiet, we'd probably have to do some more cleaning. The problem is likely going to be in the EGR valve, so let's shift our focus to the valve. Unfortunately, this valve is really hot, so we'll need to let it cool down for a few minutes. Off camera I discovered the pintle was seized, and I used a torque bit to unseize it. So that's good, but this pintle needs to also move up and down easily, and that's not happening. One of the bonus features this car came with is a complete library of factory service manuals that cover every little detail. So let's take a look at this manual. Alright, so this is the schematic of the EGR circuit, and it can be intimidating to look at. So let's not be intimidated. Anyway, the EGR system in this manual takes four pages to cover, but this picture pretty much tells us everything we need to know. This EGR valve is real simple in construction, however the way it operates is complex. So let's skip the complex part and just do the simple. The way the valve is wired is, if we put 12 volts across these two points, it'll energize the EGR valve and pull the pintle in. So at this point we filled the cavity of the EGR valve with WD-40, and now we can use this Allen wrench and a screwdriver to manually open and close the valve. Hopefully this will loosen up all the debris and allow the valve to open and close freely. Now it's going to probably take a few minutes of working this valve back and forth to free it up. Okay, so now we can apply the 12 volts across these two points and the valve should move. Let's give it a shot. Alright, so now we have the battery and we have two jumper wires connected to the EGR valve. Let's send some juice to the valve and see if it works. Yep, seems like the valve's working again. Now, we still may have a problem with the position feedback sensor, however most of the time when the sensor fails, the check engine light will almost immediately come on, and we didn't see any evidence of that. In our case, the check engine light didn't come on until we drove the car for about 10 minutes. So, I think the problem was more likely just a stuck valve. Perhaps the best course of action is to put the valve back in service and see if the check engine light comes back on. Now off camera we confirmed this was the problem and the check engine light has not come back to haunt us. So we can close the book on this one. The last thing we needed to do to get the car roadworthy was to replace the tires. I did my homework and sourced quite possibly the cheapest set of tires I could possibly find. And the best deal I could manage was at the local Walmart. In the past I've purchased premium tires and cheap tires. The thing I noticed was the cheapo tires always seem to last longer. I'm sure it has something to do with the wear rating and the new tires have a tread wear rating of 600 so allegedly that means they're good for about 80,000 miles. Who knows if they'll actually last that long but they were cheap. While we waited for the car to be serviced we went inside Walmart to check things out and oh boy you got Stand by folks we have breaking news let's join our reporter who's already on the scene. Hi Jimbo, we're live at the Robot Cantina Studios during a simulated rainstorm with a brake rotor update. As you can see the brake rotor appears to be holding up, but for how long we're not sure. The special coating is resisting the formation of rust, but as you know, in a simulated storm like this, things can change at a moment's notice. We'll keep you updated as soon as we get more information. Back to you Jimbo. Thanks Jimbo. Now let's get back to the video. And he was standing on his head when the security arrived. I tell you, going to Walmart's better than going to the movies. Anyway. With the car done, we hit the road and headed back to the workshop. So, how much did this car cost us to purchase and put back on the road? Well, we gave $1,000 for this ultra-rare 1995 Saturn wagon. Anyway, 95s are a bit of a mutt and are a combination of Gen 1 and Gen 2 parts plus 95 only parts. We were able to repair the transmission with a new set of shifter cables from the jungle site for a mere $52, and that's with free shipping. Not too shabby. Repairing the brakes set us back $195, and that includes shipping. Meh, 
The first fender cost us $10, which was quite a bargain, and then we threw another $65 at that fender to make it look pretty, but it didn't fit the car. It's an expense. The second fender cost $45, and we sourced the paint, clear coat, and primer locally from O'Reilly's for $112. The tire set us back $376, and that's for four tires with new valve stems mounted in balance, and that also includes the sales tax and disposal fees. That's definitely cheap. Of course, the state of Kansas wanted a piece of the action, and they grabbed $134 for tax and tags. So it looks like we have a decent car for our experiments for a grand total of $1,989. So if you recall, in episode 21, we managed to squeeze nearly 50 miles per gallon from our Saturn Coupe. While that's impressive, keep in mind we did that while driving around rural Kansas. As I speak, the Saturn Coupe's in the process of getting a diesel engine transplant, but we plan on continuing the fuel economy experiments with the station wagon. However, this time around, we'll test the car in a real-world environment. It'll be interesting to see how much we can squeeze from this car with some select modifications. Well, I had fun, and I hope you did as well. Until next time. (laughs) 